Assalamu alaikum. So it's actually um, my first time to attend a submission conference, and the MCs are uh, not females. So <laughs> it's a pretty remarkable day. I think Amir and Payam are like making history. They're the first male MCs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so God willing, today I wanted to talk about um, conflict resolution. And um, usually uh, someone who understands grammar cannot write a novel, right? Uh, there is art in writing. Um, so the thing about art is you can teach the basics about it, but still there is a lot of uh, learning curve that you have to build. And you have to build your own skills to do it. So not everyone um, who can read, um, for instance, about how to start a company can start a company. There is art about this. And as I think in, art, in, in conflict resolution, there is the same exact thing. There is art about it. We can know the fundamentals and the basics of it, but we have to apply our own wisdom. And of, of, like even God in the Quran uh, advises us to use wisdom when we're spreading the message, because there is art into that. So hence, I picked the title Art of Conflict Resolution. I think the first thing about um, conflict resolution is that you have to judge or you have to categorize the person that you have a conflict with. Um, if you're treating all people the same way when you have a conflict with them, as a believer, you definitely have a problem. We do not treat the believers the same way as we treat hypocrites. We don't treat them the same way we treat as people who are neutral also. We don't treat hypocrites the same way we treat neutral people. Um, so judging, I think, is the first step in any conflict resolution, is understanding that the, 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 the counterpart. Um, and it's a very tricky piece because, one, um, we were raised to not judge. And we understand that this is a very satanic concept. As in submitters, we should always judge. The second tricky piece is if you judge in the wrong way. So if you treat a hypocrite like a believer or if you treat a believer like a hypocrite. Um, in 494, God says, "O oh, you who believe, if you strike in the cause of God, you shall be absolutely sure. Um, so one of um, the litmus tests, uh, tests that I started um, applying is if I cannot own, uh, like if I cannot own the um, uh, accusation that someone is a hypocrite, if I cannot stand in the middle of a crowd and say, I think X is a hypocrite, then by default, I'm not going to treat him as a hypocrite. If I'm not 100% sure, actually 110% sure that someone is a hypocrite, um, I wouldn't even think about treating him or classifying him as, a, I mean, my point is there is nothing called a potential hypocrite, basically. That's my point. It's a binary thing. It's either a hypocrite or a believer. You cannot, like, treat him in, in between. A neutral person for me is someone who's not a believer. He's someone that um, is open to receiving the message, and he doesn't have, like, a strong attitude about it. He's not a believer for sure. Um, if someone is a believer, he, he moves to the green zone. Um, one other thing that I've also noticed is um, usually uh, in dictatorships, um, they try to spread the conspiracy theory. Everyone is a spy. Everyone wants to destroy the government. Everyone wants to destroy. That's how all dictatorships are. And I think in religion, um, dictatorships are based on hypocrisy also. Everyone is a hypocrite till proven opposite. That's how like um, Saud is. That's how like Christians. That's how a lot of people actually kind of govern their uh, populations. So as submitters, we cannot do that. We cannot, again, we cannot like treat someone as a hypocrite unless we can own it and we can like publicly say if X is a hypocrite because one, two, three. Um, so now I'm going to start with the first um, category, which is the believers. Sorry. So um, there is right now in 2016, there was 7.4 billion people living on planet Earth. If hypothetically speaking, there is 10,000 Submitters, which I don't think it's actually an accurate number. Like, if you count all the communities you know of and you like give a hypothetical number of 10,000, then the percentage of submitters on earth, and I'm talking about submitters who like believe in Quran, not like uh, who believe in the hereafter and not the first three requirements, I'm talking about submitters who practice submission. That percentage is 0.00135, whatever percent. It's like a very rare chance that you can meet someone who's a submitter. So if you look beside you, we're in the one room that we have a big percentage out of those 10,000 people. We're extremely lucky. That's actually kind of crazy how, 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 how did we meet each other. For someone like me, coming from a whole different continent, it's even insane for me to think, what are the chances that I'm going to meet not only one submitter, but like hundreds of submitters? Um, it's so confusing. 
<laughs> the other thing is, um, I, I, I've, I've been to Egypt uh, in December of last year, and um, so first day, I, um, we, like, I was meeting my team there, and they're all very re religious. So they said, it's noon prayer. So they see that I always say, God willing and stuff. So they thought that I'm going to come with a beard and like a white galabi and all of that. Then they found me coming in, and they said, it's noon prayer. And I was like, sorry, I can't pray with you. Uh, Friday prayer, sorry, I can't pray with you. Um, every discussion that they have about religion, I can just, I have to avoid. My friends, for instance, I had really interesting friends there, so I can't go out with them anymore because I cannot do whatever they are doing. The point is, I felt so lonely. I felt like I'm isolated. I don't know if you guys, like, you know, like when you're in uh, high school and you're the nerd and no one wants to talk to you ever. That's how I felt there. Like, I felt I'm so lonely and I'm very depressed because I cannot talk to anyone a language that we can speak. We cannot do things together. Um, then I come to San Jose and I was like, man, this is such a blessing. Like, I love everyone, even if I have any problems with anyone. Just the fact that they're one out of the 0.0001%, it's a big blessing. So. Um, one of the synonyms of believers versus, uh, like disbelievers, is appreciative versus unappreciative. 14.7, your Lord has decreed, the more you thank me, the more I give you. But if you turn uh, unappreciative, then my retribution is severe. So like if you're unappreciative to the fact that you are with believers, the chances are this is going to be taken out from you. And the chances are it's either one of two things. Um, it's going to fell off the path, or you're going to feel so depressed because you don't have a lot of people around you that you can go out with and like, have a social living with it. Also, one of the things is um, the definition of health in the WHO is it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. I don't really think that you can have social well-being if you don't have a group of people who share your own belief around you. So one part of your own health of your own perfect happiness is actually being among the believers. So that's why it's very, very important to make sure that you treat them in a different way. The other thing is, uh, we're actually in a war. Um, in the Quran, God says, the devil is your enemy, so treat him as an enemy. He only invites his party to be the dwellers of hell. And um, if you are in war, uh, your opponent, one of the like, very famous techniques is divide and conquer. So dividing and conquer is the policy of maintaining control over one's subordinates or subjects by encouraging dissent between them. So for Satan to win a war against believers, the best way is to divide them. Because if you are divided, we cannot work as a group to, to make it to heavens, God willing. So if you have this mentality that we are in actual war, you have to be very careful once you come into a conflict with a believer. Um, honestly, if, it is you, if you're not convinced with the rationale or with the logic behind it, um, it's just a commandment. Like, it doesn't really need a lot, like whether you buy it or not, it is a commandment. So in 3103, believers are united. You shall hold fast to the rope of God, all of you, and do not be divided. Um, in 3200, all you who believe, you shall be steadfast, you shall persevere, you shall be united, you shall observe God that you may succeed. So, it's linked to our success that we remain united. And again, that's why it is very important to have the art of conflict resolution with submitters. Um, so I, I started, also as a disclaimer, most of what I'm gonna discuss today is stuff that I'm trying to address myself. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of what I'm saying today, so may God forgive me. Uh, and I'm not trying to preach something that I feel like, uh, oh, I know how to do it, so I'm trying to tell others how to do it. But those are like my observations from Discord. Um, I tried to run a project and like done, do some data analytics about our conversations there, but I couldn't. Um, but what I was able to do is I, I started examining myself, how I react on Discord. And I figured out that one thing that I should do before I come into any conflict is check my heart rate. If my heart rate is by default high and I'm like worried, then I probably have a, a problem with the person that I'm, that I'm going into a debate with. So the thing is, you go into a religious debate with someone that you love, you're so nice, you're so kind, and you're very patient. You go into a religious debate with someone that you have any kind of an attitude with, and boom, you just want to fight, you just want to listen. So checking heart rate became a very important thing for me. Um, if you guys watch The Office, there is like this episode where everyone's heart rate goes up when the boss comes in. And honestly, I had this problem with some believers. Like once I see them, I just, my heart rate just goes up. Um, and it's a big problem because um, in 42, uh, 14, ironically, they broke up into sects only after the knowledge had come to them. 
due to jealousy and resentment among themselves. Just the fact that you have resentment towards someone is fast track to breaking into sects and going off the path. Um, the thing is, or, or where I had problem is I cannot control my emotions, right? Like I cannot love and hate someone just by pressing a button. But what I started learning is that we should love and hate in the sake of God and we should have this mentality. And the best way to do it is to pray. There is a prayer in the Quran that God like remove any kind of resentment that we have towards believers. And it actually started working. I started repeating this prayer as much as possible and, and it started working. And I also started looking at others uh, who fell off the path and I saw how it all started just because of personal hatred or personal resentment between each other. So one thing before you go into a conflict, make sure that you don't have any kind of resentment or hatred towards uh, the counterpart, who is also a believer. Um, second thing is, can I press? Um, one thing that I also started checking if the argument looks like that, if the argument looks like it's a very circular argument. Um, there's a verse that says, isn't it, is, isn't it not, is it not time for the believers to give up and realize that if God willed, he could have guided all the people? So I figured out that when I go into a discussion and I go into a circular argument, there is one of two case scenarios. One is, am I, am I, I am right and the counterpart is wrong. And in that case, if I kept just going into circular arguments, I'm not submitting and I'm not going with the system. That I'm not able to guide someone, only God can guide. So I just can make my point, give up and go away. If I'm on the wrong side and I'm still going into a circular argument, then I probably have an ego problem where I don't want to listen to the truth. So in all cases, whether you're right or whether you're wrong, going into a circular argument just is, is, means that there is a problem with you. Um, the third thing is, if I get into an argument where I'm sending messages while my counterpart is writing a message at the same time. So you know in Discord there's this tool that says several people are writing. So when I've figured out that whenever there are several people writing, we always get into big problems. And <laughs> it's obvious because we're not listening to each other's basically. We're just trying to make a point. And I think it comes from ego. It's just like you're trying to push your point regardless and you're not actively listening. Um, it's funny, like, um, Q has this trend of always copying and pasting his own message several times. Like, you ask a question, he copies the message and repeats it. And it's funny because every time I'm reading it, it seems like I didn't read the first time, which means I actually wasn't trying to read. I was just trying to answer and hence, like, you have to be careful with, like, to, act to actively try to listen to the other argument um, or the other side. And you can also remember um, 16, 127, you shall resort to patience. And I think, like, all, all of us writing at the same time is the opposite of patience. Um, so those are things that I think we need to check before we get into the conflict itself. Now, once you're in the conflict, um, th th if it's a personal conflict, those, like, you have, those are your options, or those are the things that you should do. You basically have to stand up to your rights. Uh, 226227. Um, sorry. Uh, Exempted are those who believe, lead a righteous life, come and read God frequently, and stand up for their rights. So if it's a pers personal conflict, you obviously have to stand up for your rights. Um, but you also have to forgive and forget. Um, so the messenger teaches us that big souls love, small souls hate. And in 64.14, oh, you who believe your, um, your spouses and your children can be your enemies, beware. If you pardon, forget, and forgive, then God is forgiver most merciful. Um, and I've, I took a lot of time not able to like, um, how can we mix both? How can I stand up for my rights, but at the same time forgive and forget? Um, and that's, hence, it's an art. I, I'm trying to develop myself into that. I think there is still a long way, but I definitely think in two years of submission, I, I started growing into that direction. But there is a very fine balance between both of them, between standing up for your right, but again, once the conflict is over, you just forget it, like as if nothing has happened. Um, there are things that you should not do. So, for you guys who don't know that, this is Mo Salah. He's one of the best <laughs> soccer players on earth right now. Um, he's Egyptian. And he's Egyptian, yeah, not Persian. <laughs> um, but um, one thing that you should not try to be is you don't want to be Mo Salah. 
Uh, you don't want to be, uh, you want to take the defeated side. You don't want to be the one who just wants to win and score goals. It's like, I'm gonna keep talking to you like, bam, here I win that, bam, here I win that. You shouldn't have that mentality. But honestly, I, I see myself doing this a lot in Quran studies where like, I wanna be like, I wanna score a goal now. Like, I'm, I can see it, like, I'm on the right side, I have the verse, and now I can do it, right? You have all the tools to basically score a goal. And I think this mentality, just the fact that you have this, is not, some, is not a righteous attitude, uh, because we have to be on the defeated side. So the defeated side doesn't mean giving up, or means like you give up your point, or you don't fight for it. It just means you don't want to win for your own personal satisfaction. You want to win either because you want to defend God's word or because it is your right that you want to stand up for. Um, and this is really hard, especially for people who are competitive, like trying to eliminate this Mosalah mentality is not an easy thing. Um, the other thing that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't do like this in your conversations. Uh, you shouldn't beat around the bush, basically. It's like when you're asked yes or no questions, you should be able to say yes and no. Um, and I have this problem all not only like um, in conflicts, but generally speaking, is like I hate when people don't avoid the yes and no's, right? Because if you don't have a yes and no for it, it's one of two things. It's either you don't have a point, but you're wasting my time and your time, or you have a point and you're not able to own it. Like you don't want to like push it. And if you can't own it, how are you expecting me to own it? Like if you cannot tell me yes and no, how are you expecting me to believe you? If you cannot tell me yes and no, how are you expecting me to keep listening to you? Um, in 2.189, um, we all know this verse, um, it goes like in the middle of it, it is not righteous to beat around the bush. And I feel like avoiding yes and no's is by definition beating around the bush. So those are a couple of things that I feel like we should not avoid. And one good litmus test is like, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot answer yourself with yes and no, then probably you don't understand or you don't have a full vision about your problem uh, or your argument. Um, your options though, like, so you did all of that, the end resolution is one of two things. It's either that you can fight back equivalently, so the law of equivalence in 545, um, and we decreed for them in that, that the life for the life, the eye for the eye, the nose for the nose, the ear for the ear, the tooth for the tooth, and an equivalent injury for an injury. Um, but obviously this applies to personal problems. Um, the other one is you can just, you just give up. Um, in 16126, and if you punish, you shall inflict an equivalent punishment, but if you resort to patience instead of revenge, it would be better for the patient ones. Now, if it is a religious discussion, you don't have the option of fighting. What you have the option for is standing up for the truth. Um, so, in 3104, let there be a community of you who invite to what is good, advocate righteousness, and forbid evil. These are the winners. Um, sorry. Um, so this is one thing that you have to do. The other thing is, you actually have to give up at one point. In, is, it not, is it not time for the believers again to give up and realize that if God willed, he could have guided all the people? So at one point in the discussion, you have to learn that you have to let go. Because if, if you are not letting go, it's no longer about religion for you. It's obviously it's about your ego. It's about you winning the argument, not about winning a point. Because God is telling us that we have to give up at one point and just believe that God is the only one who can guide. Now, what if you are not part of the argument? What if... Uh, you're actually like, um, you're one of the witnesses or you're the one in between, right? You're this guy at the back in green. <laughs> so the, the, apathy is condemned, right? So there is no, at no point you as a submitter are not involved in your community affairs or in the submitter's affairs in general. So you're always actually part of any conflict. And in 499, God teaches us how we can do that. So it's called, it says, reconcile the believers. If two groups of believers fought with each other, you shall reconcile them, period. If one group aggresses against the other, you shall fight the aggressing group until they submit to God's command. Once they submit, you shall reconcile the two groups equitably. Um, the way I understand this verse is, wow. The way I understand this verse is, um, it's sequential. It's not all happening in parallel. It's not like you fight, then you reconcile. It's, it, goes into, it, it goes into steps. One step is you first you try to reconcile them. If it does, doesn't work, then you fight. When they submit, then you start doing the resolution. I, 
I've heard the understanding that you start with fighting, then when they submit, you start reconciling them. And I don't personally believe into that. I think it's actually a big problem if we think like this. It starts with reconciling first. The second thing is um, you need to be fair, right? Uh, you need to be equitable uh, in judging. So um, believers are always equitable, but now it really becomes tricky when someone is your friend or someone is your blood relative. Um, I have noticed in many cases that people get really excited when someone is their very close friend or their blood relative, and they don't get half excited when someone else is just a regular walking submitter. Um, and this is not really cool. The reason is we, um, one of the interesting concepts in submission that I haven't seen anywhere else is the fact that we are not related by blood like almost any other community on earth. We're actually related by belief. So we have um, in, one, in, in 1146, God is telling Noah, he said, oh Noah, he's not of your family. It is unrighteous to ask me. So in that concept, we are all actually related at the very same level because what combines us is not the blood, it is the belief. Now if I get excited for someone being my friend or for someone being my cousin or someone being whatever, and I'm not getting excited to a fellow submitter, then I'm not actually abiding with that philosophy or with that concept that we are at the end of the day, one united family. Actually God calls us the real family. Um, one submitter was making a comment before that the same argument happened that no one was defending him the same way we were defending someone else. And it actually got me thinking. I was one of the people who didn't defend him. And I think because I have personal preferences, and those personal preferences can take me off the path. So this is very important that we have to be, um, OK, I'm going to go real quick. Um, now, the other thing, if someone is a hypocrite, right? Uh, so this is Sun Tzu. This is like, he wrote the book, The Art of War. And he said that the ultimate purpose of war is peace. Now, with hypocrites, we're not going to have peace. So there is no war to begin with, right? There is no personal war. There is no personal wins. It's God's system that they're going to be there. Am I out of time? Um, OK. Uh, yeah, so it's God's system that they're going to be there. So we don't have a, a religious conflict with them. We have a personal conflict. Uh, we don't have a personal conflict with them. We only have a religious conf uh, conflict. Um, so. In 7310, God says, and remain steadfast in the face of their utterances and disregard them in a nice manner. So in personal conflicts with disbelievers, we have to disregard them in a nice manner. There's also uh, one that talks about this. Uh, do, not obey the, do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Disregard their insults. So the fact that the disbeliever or hypocrite is insulting you, you don't actually have to respond. Because if you are responding, you are getting into a war. And by definition, you want peace. You want this to be resolved. And as a matter of fact, you came here to earth to fight forever with hypocrites. So there is no religious conflicts that we can attain with them. As far as personal conflicts goes, no, I'm sorry, um, my last piece is, if you're not part of the conflict, if like two, a submitter is fighting with a hypocrite, you have to make sure that you do not ally yourself. This is your responsibility. You, don't, you do not ally yourself with the wrong, uh, with the wrong side. Why should you divide, uh, sorry, uh, cho um, choose your friends carefully. The believers never ally themselves with the disbelievers instead of the believers. Whoever does this is exiled from God. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, uh, with this verse, 49.10, the believers are members of one family. You shall keep the peace within your family and reverence God that you may attain mercy. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Kareem. We're going to start with the Q&A, and Q, you're first. Very good uh, analogy and speech. Uh, I was listening to uh, your comment about uh, in 64.14 that, that God is telling that your spouse and your children can be your enemy, uh, so you need to f uh, forgive and forget. But... In 45.14, God says to the believers, uh, oh, you believe, uh, you know, forgive those who do not expect the days of God. So talking to the ignorant and the hypocrite or whatever, those who don't believe. So um, do you see that, uh, that uh, the specific s statement that was made in 65.14 uh, 
uh, or is it 6414? I'm sorry. That that says uh, to to the children and spouses applies to uh, others. Uh, for example, people are, who are not your spouse and children. And I, I understand the forgive part, but I want to know um, how you expand that to forgetting also can apply to uh, to a person who is not you're not living with in, your, in not your household like your spouse and child, children. Sure. Um, so. The, 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 when I was mentioning this, I was mentioning it in the context of having a conflict with another believer. So another believer is by default part of your family. So I would treat him the same way that I would treat my spouse or my children. More importantly, we learn from the story of Joseph how, like at the end, after all what they have done for them, after all what they have done for him, he just forgave, just forgave them and, and kind of forgot about it. Uh, we also know from the messenger in. Um, uh, the, the, the fact that you have not only to take the defeated side, but that the big souls love and the smaller souls hate, and just the fact that he did not let go and he didn't forgive something is a negative feeling. It's by default hatred. Uh, and what I've learned is like when you don't forgive and forget, next time you get into an argument, your heart rate is going to go up because you already have some personal resentment. I don't think that you hate someone between a day and a night, right? You hate them in two, three years, going into several arguments, and every time you build one it's one break after one break, then you have this big wall that you cannot take it down. Um, so I definitely would forgive and forget with all believers. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Thank you for an excellent speech. I have a couple questions. Uh, first one is about when Rashad says um, everyone is a potential submitter. Can you elaborate on your um, speech a little bit with that particular the understanding of submission within that, uh, the categorizations that you had with uh, believer neutral and... Um, sure. Yeah. So um, the way I, I look at it is um, people are... So for me, all hypocrites are disbelievers, but not all disbelievers are hypocrites, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, they're all at the same day one category in the way that you treat them. Um, for me, as someone who's a potential submitter, is someone who's not actively fighting a believer. As long as they are not actively fighting, then he is a potential submitter till proven opposite. Um, a believer that I meant in my presentation is someone that attends the masjid, is someone that goes to Friday prayers, do the five contact prayers, is like a practicing submitter, not just about to be a submitter. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. I forgot my second question, but inshallah I can come back when I do remember. So, so, so again, let's keep it at one question per, per individual. Um, Salam alaikum. Yeah. Great presentation, brother. Um, so during the uh, day, many times throughout the day, through our Salat prayers, we make very important uh, declarations and we ask God um, to guide us in the right path by us who is included the submitters the believers the non-believers the hypocrites and if everyone is included how important it is to be taking that into consideration during our conflict resolution process thank you thank you um so we, we know from the Quran that if God has willed, he would have guided all the people. But it's God's system, uh, or that's why we came here, that we are not all guided, right? So I don't see us as praying for something that goes against God's system. So obviously when it says us, it is referring to all the submitters and all the believers, because that's our, those are the people that we care for. Because the rest, is, re the rest of the surah is like, and let us not be on the path of people who incur wrath. Right? So definitely we are praying for the believers. We also know that we can never pray for hypocrites or disbelievers. Um, we only pray for, for, for fellow submitters. So the way I understand us, it is referring to us, to the real family, basically. No, we, we pray for them definitely to be guided. But in that surah, the way I look at it is like we're praying for us as a submitter family to be, we won't pray for their forgiveness, obviously, but we can pray for their guidance. Applause.